Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Uh, as as uh, Dr. Dasha mentioned, my name is Aki Ohashi. I'm with the Palo Alto Research Center Park. And uh, I'm very excited to be able to speak to you today and tell you a little bit about um, what Park does and uh, a case study on um, an intelligent system that we are working uh, with a, an Asian rail operator uh, in implementing in, in real life. And as, as if you're familiar with PARC, you know that you know, we do a lot of research. Very few of them actually make, make it out into the real world. So we're pretty excited that this is, is headed in that direction. Um, I Just a little bit of more background on myself. My, my parents are Japanese, but I was born in the US, uh, although I, I've spent about five years in Japan as an adult. Uh, mostly in the venture startup and venture capital area. And um, I've been at Park now for almost six years. And just prior to Park, I was at a venture capital firm in Japan, Tokyo, uh, doing venture uh, investments, uh, mostly for, for overseas investments from Japan. Uh, and then there was a, a, a great opportunity at Park to do business development and try to bring technologies over to not only Japan, but the rest of Asia as well. Um, and so I moved back over here and um, have been, been here for uh, almost six years now. Um, so I, you know, I've got some prepared slides, but please feel free to uh, ask any questions as we go through. I, I like to keep these things interactive, and if there are things that are not clear or if you have questions about them, um, you know, feel free to just raise your hand and, and let me know um, uh, what your thoughts are. Okay. Uh, so how many of you are familiar with PARC? Have you, you, You've heard of Park. Okay, so Park is that's great. That's great. Park is um, it stands the uh, P A R C stands for Palo Alto Research Center, and and it's actually very close to here. It's about uh, uh, five minute drive if you're not worried about uh, looking for 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 parking. Um, it, and uh, if you get lost, this is what the sign looks like out in front of the buildings. But we're very close um, to uh, to Stanford. And we are a subsidiary of Xerox. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about how we became a subsidiary as opposed to just a research group. Um, but as you can see here, so here are some of the things that Park has invented uh, in the past. We're a research center. We've in invented things like the laser printer, uh, the first personal computer, Ethernet, the graphical user interface itself. Uh, that's something that was also invented at Park, and, and a few other things. I won't go into to all of these uh, that are listed up here. But as you can see, um, Park was incorporated actually in 2002. So I'm going to pop over to the next slide. Park itself was formed in 1970 as a research division within Xerox. But then we were spun out and became a company in 2002. And even though we were spun out, we, uh, Xerox still owns us 100%, so we have a really good, strong connection with Xerox. Uh, but we're, because we're a company now, we're able to do um, a few things that we were not able to do in the past. And you know, people will wonder, well, why would you spin out a company and then make it 100% subsidiary? Don't, don't you usually spin it out so you can get external investors? I mean, that's a really good point. And I'm going to back up to actually to the previous slide. You can see a lot of these technologies on here. The laser printer was great for Xerox, right? Xerox is a printing and copying company. There's a new thing called laser printer, which prints things faster and cleaner. Makes perfect sense. So they were able to commercialize that and subsequently paid for the park investment many times over. PC Workstation, actually, not so much. Um, Xerox actually tried to, well, they did commercialize the PC and were, were the, was the first company to actually uh, commercialize the mouse. But quickly, um, you know, Xerox's model was not really focused on small personal devices or personal computers. They were used to selling enterprise um, machines, printers. And so uh, it didn't work out, and they got out of that business. Ethernet. Xerox was not interested in commercializing networking equipment to begin with. And so Bob Metcalf, the inventor of Ethernet, he eventually decided to just leave Xerox. And he started a little company called 3Com uh, and became very successful with Ethernet. Graphical user interface. Uh, many of you may know the story behind this. Uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Steve who heard about this and decided to come take a look. Now, many people don't know that 
Uh, at that time, Xerox had uh, an investment in Apple, Steve's company. And uh, so through that relationship, uh, he had access to a lot of the research that we were doing. He came, he saw, he borrowed, and the rest is history. So the reason why I'm talking about this is, is that you know, in the past, when there are technologies that fit into printing and copying, then, then it was relatively easy for Xerox to take and commercialize and derive benefit from it. But if there were things that didn't fit into that model, um, things kind of were leaked away or however you want to phrase it. But Xerox wasn't able to, to capitalize on that very much. So the decision was made in 2002, let's spin Park out, make it a company, and give Park the ability to work directly now with other companies, other organizations, to commercialize the technologies that Xerox uh, is, is never going to commercialize itself. Uh, and so that's the reason for that uh, change. Park itself is about, um, the number is a little bit old, it's about 350 scientists and engineers and ethnographers and business staff, um, most with PhDs. Uh, we have uh, a, a, a large number of different projects, both in hardware and software. Um, we have multiple business models to try to take these technologies into the real world. And we have a patent portfolio of about 2,500 patents and, and about 150 new patents every year. Any questions so far? Is everything okay? Who pays the bill? Who pays the bill? Uh, that's a great question. I'll get into it more in a bit, but essentially Xerox gets to pay uh, only about half of what we cost, right? So basically our bill is, 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 our, is our revenue, right? So uh, Xerox puts in about half based on the research that we do for them. And then the other half comes from working with private industry, uh, government, and then licensing of our patent portfolio. So that's, a, that's actually a great question that leads into this. Um, so this is a very typical kind of process for taking R&D uh, and then moving up into um, productization, sales, support. Park really focuses on this really early stage. I mean, we're, we say R&D, but we're really big R and little d. Uh, we have a few hundred scientists, and we work in really small teams. We come up with new ideas. Um, you know, we, we use the, the lean startup method, agile method of, of iterating through lots of different projects uh, and trying a lot of things out. And if they work, we keep them moving forward. If they don't, we try something else. And for the rest of this commercialization process, we rely on our partners. Now, the partners are the, the folks that I just mentioned, other companies, uh, Xerox included, uh, the government, the US government funds a lot of our projects, um, and then uh, spin outs, you know, startups and, and spin outs. Uh, are also the partners that help us commercialize. And the reason why we do that is, you know, we feel like we're pretty good at the, the research part. We have a lot of really, really smart scientists and we do a lot of the early stage research and we try things out in the lab and, and see if they work. We're not so good at the engineering, you know, the development, the engineering, the commercialization, you know, obviously sales and marketing, things like that. We don't have those capabilities. So we, we really decided to focus, focus on, on this piece. Um, and that, you know, that allows us to just continue to come up with new things and not have to scale up to be able to do these types of things. Yes? Uh, what is the big difference between the research in university and the research in park? That's a great question. So the research in the university and research at park, the types of things we research, uh, I, I would say, are pretty similar. Park does a lot of fundamental research, basic research on technologies, you know, things like networking protocols, new materials, uh, new processes. I think probably the biggest difference is that Park has a PNL, meaning we have to make a profit or at least break even every year. So we have this this business pressure to take what we do and make money off of it, or at least not lose money. Um, and so. The way we do research is, I think it's a little bit more commercial focused and that when we come up with new ideas, we don't just think about the technology. About 50% of the evaluation of that technology and that project is actually a business decision. Meaning, if we come up with this or we invest in this technology, is there a chance for it to be commercialized? Is there a potential market you know, three to five to 10 years into the future? And if we can't answer that, or at least be conf you know, fairly confident that there's a potentially a market, then we don't do it. Right? So we don't just do research for research sake or blue sky research. Um, we really, we've, from the very beginning, there's always a business case that goes along with 
the research. And that's, that's probably one of the biggest differences between a park and a university, and also park pre-2002 and park post-2002. Yes? So park is not a cost center. So you have, how do you measure the p and for the Reasonable what's it's, the, what's yeah. the time frame you it, It's uh, yeah. all the time, quarterly, uh, you know, with pro by project. Uh, I mean, it's, it's run like a business. So each project has a profitability target, and obviously at the end of the quarter, everything gets rolled up and gets reported to, we're not public, so Xerox gets those numbers, and then at the end of the year, they expect us to at least break even. Um, and, and so there's, you know, I'm not a researcher. I, I have a business background and have done a variety of different things at startups. I don't do any research, and so we have people like myself who have come in and, and had the experience of commercializing technology, uh, and we have a, a commercial business team that works with the researchers, both in the interactions with potential customers, as well as evaluating the technology and th thinking about how to move that forward. So here are some of the things that we're working on now. Um, the, the specific topic I'm going to talk about is, is, is related to big data. But other than that, we do a lot of hardware, a lot of um, other types of research. Um, there's a energy research, and this, this includes everything from um, printed batteries to solar to um, an, an advanced uh, fiber optic sensor that we're doing. Um, a lot of our research, not surprisingly, is related to printing. And so we have things like printed electronics. We have um, you know, built prototypes of, of print, the, you know, uh, first integrated uh, fully printed memory. Uh, we're doing now 3D printing with three, uh, printed electronics integrated into them. Um, so lots of printing related research. Um, as the place that invented Ethernet, we have a, a, a strong networking tradition. And even today, the biggest single project at PARC is actually a networking project. And it's a, uh, a, a technology we call content-centric networking. And we think that, uh, well, we're hoping that this would be the next generation internet, basically, where we get rid of IP addresses and, and put, instead of putting IP addresses on devices, we would, we would put content addresses on content and do networking that way. And, and that's, a, that's a whole other topic, um, but, but it's a new way to think about networking and uh, we, we feel like uh, could be a really viable um, next generation internet. Uh, digital design and manufacturing. Uh, so along with a trend in 3D printing and moving design and um, manufacturing into the cloud, we have a lot of projects, particularly funded by the government actually, around digital manufacturing. I'm gonna skip over this uh, innovation services for a second. Optoelectronics is around lasers and LEDs. Uh, we are creating new lasers all the time, new wavelengths of lasers. Uh, we were the first company outside of Japan uh, there were a few companies in Japan that, that were uh, further along than we were, but the first company outside of Japan to be able to manufacture a blue laser. And we have continued our research into new, new wavelengths of uh, both lasers and LEDs, and we make those ourselves in our lab. Big data analytics, uh, particularly around um, cyber physical systems, machines, industrial uh, equipment, things like that, and this is the, I'll, I'll have some examples of that. Clean tech, obviously related to energy, uh, but also Things like water filtration, which, which is also surprisingly tied to uh, printer uh, research, and then some uh, research in health and wellness. Now, the reason why I skipped over innovation services is because innovation services is different than all the other areas in that this is more of a consulting business for us. So we realize that being a commercial entity since two, 2002 and thinking about how to commercialize technologies ourselves we realize that that's actually really, really valuable information to other companies, right? Other large companies, they have research centers, they're spending millions, if not tens of millions, and sometimes billions of dollars in R&D um, and, and, and not getting the ROI that they would like out of it. We have a lot of experience in how, you know, thinking about how to take fundamental technologies, emerging technologies, and think about new commercialization, new businesses, uh, things like that. So this is a, a consulting, primarily a consulting service that we offer to uh, outside, also internally, but out, outside. Um, and it's, it's in particular, um, it's, it's had a, a huge uh, pickup in Japan. 
And, and thus, uh, we have a small office in Tokyo, and they're all uh, staffed by these innovation services consultants. So here are some of the companies that we've worked with that, are, uh, that we're allowed to, to, to talk about publicly. Um, we have a lot more that have, um, you know, they said due to confidenti confidentiality reasons, they would not like us to uh, talk about in public. Uh, but we do work with, as you can see, a lot of large companies and then some names you probably never heard of because there are some very small companies. Um, and those are primarily our kind of two target areas, the large companies with very large R&D budgets and then the small companies that are really focused on commercializing technology. Okay, so that's the introduction portion of the presentation. Any other questions or comments up to now? Everybody good? All right. So now I want to talk a little bit more about, um, yes, sure. You mentioned about the innovation service and uh, after the 2002, yes. I mean, so how do you find out the framework or the way to consult the other companies to make innovation? We are basically just using our own experiences, right? So after 2002, we had to come up with new processes, for example, new processes for how you come up with project ideas and then how you evaluate those as they go through, right? You can't now just think about the technology and think about how good the technology is. You have to think about the market. So we have a process now where a new project is, you know, all our most pretty much all our projects are thought up by our own researchers. They're not from outside, right? So our researchers come up with project ideas, we develop them. But then there's an evaluation process for do we continue to invest or, or should we stop it, right? And the evaluation process prior to 2002 was really focused on technology, right? Is this an interesting technology? Is it unique and novel? Um, do we have the capabilities and the competencies to accomplish what we're trying to do? Things like that, right? And of course, those things are very important and there are, there are must-haves, but post-2002, we actually have a whole other half of the evaluation criteria, which is the business side of things, as I mentioned. You know, what does the market look like in five years, and could this technology fit into that market? You know, what are the current manufacturers and current vendors saying about these types of technologies? And so it's not just sitting down in a room and, and, and discussing those things. It's going out and speaking to end users, going to partner companies going, you know, hiring consultants, bringing in entrepreneurs and residents. There's a whole um, variety of things that we do to try to get this information when we evaluate the technology. And then there's a process to go through how do you evaluate each project as well as how do you evaluate your entire portfolio of projects, right? Um, and, you know, we did that for ourselves and we realized, hey, that's really valuable information for other companies. And so we, it's, it's, it's all pretty much based on the learnings that we've had based on our experiences. Um, you know, obviously we take the frameworks, the lean startup frameworks, things like that that are out there, and then we incorporate them, we use them, we try them out, we, we change them, and then you know, we take what works for us, and then, you know, we, we, um, then we make suggestions to our client companies based on their situation, right? So they're, they're tweaked, obviously, in, 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 in each situation. Okay, so I want to talk about uh, this um, specific uh, in, uh, engagement that we've had with this Asian rail operating company. Um, this is going on about three years now. About three years ago, we started working with them. And um, it's really around asset management, uh, maintenance, essentially. A maintenance of their equipment, and they wanted to do maintenance better for their equipment. This company is, is, is quite big, uh, and they have a pretty big research uh, effort in a variety of different things. And one of the things they wanted to do was, hey, we want to make our maintenance processes much smarter, more intelligent. Um, they started, you know, so with this big data tr phenomenon and, and uh, sensors getting cheaper, and um, IOT, they started collecting data from their equipment, right? So they put sensors on their doors for their car train cars. They put cameras underneath their um, trains to take pictures of the rails as they're going by. Um, they started outfitting the infrastructure with, with sensors, and they started collecting all this data. Uh, but then they didn't really know what to do with that data. Um, so they had some people internally playing with it. They've hired some consultants, and they got some marginal 
uh, benefit, and they came to us and said, hey, look, you know, we've got all this data. Can, you, you know, can we work together? Can you help us? And um, essentially what they wanted to do was improve their maintenance processes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about maintenance because Park also has a lot of research and maintenance, uh, and not initially in rail equipment. Um, not surprisingly, it's in around printers and copiers. Uh, we have a lot of, if you, you know, if, imagine a printer or a copier has a little panel on it, and that little panel will tell you, um, you know, you're out of paper, or you're about to go, go out of toner, or your fuser is about to go bad, or the roller has, has gone worn down. That type of information, you know, the piece of component is not just telling you that, it ha actually has to be calculated using algorithms that are using the data from the sensors that are in the printer. And a lot of those algorithms have been developed by PARC. And so we have a lot of experience in trying to make these printers and copiers uh, a little bit smarter. So our vision basically is to go from, I'll go into these a little bit more, but time-based maintenance. So if you can, if you just, even just looking at the word, basically maintaining things based on a certain set period of time to condition-based maintenance, which is maintaining things, repairing things based on the actual condition of that piece of equipment at that time. And then in the future, self-actualizing, uh, self-analyzing systems where the systems themselves have the ability to analyze what's going on with itself. And then adapt to the situation, right? And this could be a single system, a single component, or it could be a flock of components kind of working together to um, respond to some kind of, uh, of, of issue. And this piece is bolded right now because I think this is kind of where we're at. We're, we're, we're trending towards it, I guess. We're not, we're not really at condition-based maintenance yet. Um, most things are time-based maintenance, and I've got a, a, an example here. You know, I, I've got a, a Prius, right? I think a lot of you have cars, uh, maybe most of you. Um, and I would say, you know, car maintenance is purely time-based, right? You've got a manual that has instructions about you know, when do you change the oil every 5,000 miles or five months, and then you go and take it in for a, a tune-up or a repair every 30, 50, 75,000 miles, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is, is not necessarily time, but it's set on a predetermined uh, pre, uh, pre, um, uh, um, these metrics that really don't take into account what's going on, right? If, if I drive like a maniac, then I probably need to get my oil changed more and I probably uh, should get tune-ups more often, right? Uh, if I'm driving very, very conservatively, then maybe I can go longer than this. And so the problem with time-based maintenance is that if you're too early with your maintenance, then you're wasting time and money, right? You're, you're doing maintenance on something that doesn't need maintenance. Uh, but you don't know that because you're not really thinking about that. And of course, if you're too late, then you, you're in trouble, right? Your car breaks down on the side of the road, and you should have had that looked at a couple weeks ago, right? So time-based maintenance has a lot of issues. So there is a better way. Um, and that is condition-based maintenance, like we said, like I talked about. You know, performing maintenance only when needed, right? And this results in reduced downtime, saving costs, uh, of unnecessarily repairs, uh, and then you can also, if you do it smart, then extend the useful life of that piece of equipment. So how do you do it? So this is, this is the kind of intelligent systems piece of the uh, presentation, and I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty, uh, mostly because I can't, um, but I think it's really interesting. Um, so you know, think about a, a, a system here. I just illustrated it as a black box. But basically, what you do is you put sensors on there and you collect data, right? So there's a lot of data coming out of that whatever it is box. And in the example that I'm going to talk about, it'll be a piece of rail equipment. Um, and the data can be, you know, almost anything, but things like, you know, vibration, uh, temperature, of course, if there's some kind of gas, um, pressure, uh, speed, voltage, if there's electricity involved, current, uh, stress, strain, shock. But, you know, there's a variety of different things you can measure, right? And that can all be... The, the data that's coming out that you, you might potentially use. And then you build a model, right? And the building of the model, this is where the intelligent system comes in. This is where you use uh, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning to come up with the best models and the best algorithms um, for that piece of equipment. And so what do you do with the model? A couple things, right? Uh, first is diagnose, right? Diagnosis is 
from the model, you can figure out, oh, what went wrong? You know, that, that yeah, something was funny with the sensor, you know, what's going on? Right? That's, the, that's the first thing you can do. And then once you get more sophisticated, you can actually say, well, prognosis, right? What will go wrong, right? So for the copier printer example, if, you're, if you run out of paper, then you know you ran out of paper. But here, for prognosis, you can actually tell um, based on your paper usage when you might run out of paper. Or another thing is um, things like the roller and the components inside your machine. You can, based on what, what the feedback is from your sensors, you can say um, you know, when you might need to replace your roller or when you might need to replace your, your fuser, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And that's based on uh, the models that you, um, you come up with, you build. And how do you do it? There are two main ways. There's a physics-based model that you actually build a physics-based model inside the system, and you're modeling out if a piece moves here, then it, you know, it causes a reaction here, et cetera, et cetera. Or you do a very data-driven model where you just have a bunch of data you come in, and you figure out where some of the um, anomalies might be, or you try to classify them based on what that data is. And you don't actually know what's going on inside that piece of component. And then, of course, if you add those together, you can have hybrid models, which um, in most cases that ends up being, if, you, if you're able to spend the time and resources on it, ends up being the best, best method. I still have you. Any questions? Yes, I will absolutely do that. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is, for the, I've got three examples. Um, and again, I'm not going to get too technical, but uh, I've got an example of a data-driven one. And then I've got an example of a hybrid one, where I actually did both of these and combined those. Uh, just really quickly on the physics-based, uh, this is as deep as I'll go. But you build the model. So when I say physics-based, you actually will build it in a, in, a, in a piece of software, something like Modelica. And you build kind of what this system might look like, right? And, and work, act like. And then you validate the model, you know, figure out that it works well, and then you actually augment that model with failures, meaning if something were to go wrong, if something were to break in the system, how would it break? Right? You have to teach the model those things. So you teach the model that, and then you compare what you get out of that model to actual data, and then you can figure out what's going on. On the data-driven model, you actually don't know what's going on inside the system, right? So for the rail example, uh, I'll, I'll have an example of the door. Uh, we put some, or the client put some sensors on the door, and we got some data out of the door. But our model, we use data-driven on that, on that example, and our model does not know that it's a door, and it does not know that there's an actuator. The only thing the model knows is that there's a bunch of data coming out, and then it, it tries to classify that data based on some criteria that we give it. And um, you know, in this, in this uh, example, you, you need a lot of data to train the model, essentially. In the physics space, you, you need to know what's going on inside the device, but you don't need that much data to actually build the model. And that's, that's one of the key differences. Um, but he, this, is, this is really where you use a lot of the machine learning. So the machine learning is done here. You take the data, and I won't go too into the details, but you segment the data into different, um, uh, different segments that make sense. And then you use machine learning to extract uh, these things called features, which then you do calculations on. And you classify the features, and you figure out if the data looks like this, then something must, something must be, for example, in the door case, something must be stuck in the door. If the data looks like this, then uh, the lubrication is getting old and needs to replace. Um, and I'll go into that in, in more detail, detail in a second. So I'm going to now jump into the collaboration example. Um, and there's three examples here. There's, so, you know, the, there's a lot of equipment to, to run a railroad. Um, and the, the ones that we looked at were the door, uh, the switch machine, the machine that switches the rails when you're going in different directions, and then um, the rails themselves. Because uh, the rails themselves actually uh, will start deteriorating over time, develop cracks, holes, um, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they wanted to know more about the rails. OK. So the first one is uh, around the doors. Um, and I don't have a whole lot of, uh, there's a lot of stuff on here, and I apologize for that. I don't have a whole lot of pictures. But essentially, um, you know, the doors are one of the largest causes of problems and delays for um, 
uh, for trains, right? So one statistic is 30% of all delays, this is in the UK, are caused by the doors, right? The doors are, are stuck, uh, someone is stuck in the doors, something is stuck in the doors, et cetera, et cetera, right? And I think uh, if you've taken trains, you may have experienced these things, particularly in Asia where there's a lot of trains, maybe not so much uh, here in the US. Um, and the failures are often due to things that are undetected, uh, underlying you know, causes, things that are stuck in there, like I, uh, like I mentioned, or maybe the guide rails are deformed. Um, the, the bolts that are holding the doors have started go uh, going loose, getting loose, things like that, right? And so um, the, this company collected a lot of data from the doors, and eventually, after looking through all the data, um, we, we actually realized that only one piece of information was necessary to figure out what was going on with the door. And that was the current, the amount of current that was being sent to the motor, to the actuator uh, of the door, and that's it. And based on that, we developed models and we used machine learning to figure out the best algorithms. And we were able to classify, the client wanted us to classify each situation into, I think what it says, seven underlying causes, right? So you have a normal situation and then you have seven situations where you have something that's not normal. So one could be there's something stuck in the door, right? Another one could be the lubrication has gone bad, et cetera, et cetera. And based on the profile of the current that is getting sent to the door, we, they wanted us to classify, or we were able to classify what was going on in that situation. Now, why, the, why is the current important? And the current is important is because if you, uh, if you have something stuck in the door, the motor is going to try harder, right? And so you need to send more current to the motor. And so now we know that there's something weird going on. And based on the profile of how much current is sent to the motor at, at a certain um, amount of time, each situation has its own signature, right? If there's something stuck in the door, the profile looks one way. If the bolts are loose, the profile looks another way. If the lubrication has gone bad, then the profile looks a, a different way. And we're able to figure out, based on um, the algorithms and the data, uh, what's going on. And we were able to achieve 98% um, accuracy on classifying the information. And they were, they were stunned, uh, really. And, and one of the things that, that was really um, we were even surprised about is that so the door, as I mentioned, has bolts, obviously, holding the door into the frame of the, of the car. And they, on purpose, for this test, they, on purpose, loosened some of the bolts. And they said, hey, you know, we got this situation. It doesn't happen that often. And then, you know, if you can't figure it out, no big deal. Uh, but can you, you know, can you let us know if the bolts are, are loose on the door? Um, so he said, all right, we'll give it a try. We ran our algorithms. And uh, surprisingly, we were able to tell that the bolts were loose. And furthermore, what was really surprising is not only were we able to tell that the bolts were loose or not, we were able to tell which bolt was loose. And they were like, they were, they were on the floor. They said, oh my goodness, we never thought, never would have thought you would have been able to figure that out. So what's going on now is these are screenshots of this interface that we're developing for them. So initially it was, you know, raw technology, we just developed a bunch of algorithms, and then there's a really, really clunky interface that we, we gave to them. They said, hey, that's awesome, uh, but we can't use it because we don't know what's going on. So uh, we're now developing a more slick kind of web-based interface so that they can uh, try it out. And uh, once we finish, this is the phase that we're in now. Once this gets delivered and used, uh, the next step would be then actual commercialization. All right, so this is an example of a data, a purely data-driven approach. When do you think that's going to be done? Um, the prototype will be done this year, the demo, and then they'll, they'll use it, and I think probably next year, uh, if all goes well, they'll, they'll, put, they'll, they'll pull the trigger to go into um, development for a, a production version, so probably in a couple years if, 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 we, uh, if everything you know, goes, goes, goes smoothly. So the second example is a switch machine. So the switch machine is the, uh, the point machine is also called the, the, the thing that moves the rails between the tracks when you're going in different directions. And you know, obviously this is a really, really important piece of equipment because if it, if it fails then you could have some really, really uh, bad things happen. 
right? So one of the things, one of the challenges here is that with the data-driven approach, you actually need situations where something goes wrong, right? And you need the data for the, the, the fault situation, and you need the data for the normal situation, and then you build models based on the information that you have. With these point machines, because they are such important pieces of equipment, they don't go wrong. They've already been designed and engineered so that failures of these pieces of equipment are very, very rare. And so you have to wait 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years for something to actually go wrong with these things. So you don't have the data for the fault situation, right? So, I mean, of course you can do accelerated testing where you apply heat or, or water or various things to accelerate your testing, um, but obviously you're, you're creating artificial situations which um, are not necessarily good for, for your model. So here what we did was we said, okay, let's, let's, so we're saying there's limited nominal data, meaning there's no data or very little data for the failed situation, but we know what that machine looks like. And so what we did was we built a, uh, a physics-based model in the system, and then we used the data that was collected and built the best models we could out of those two and then combined those two together to create a model that could then predict uh, what's going on with um, the system. And, and this is another one where you know, we, we got 99% accuracy uh, on, on, the, um, on, the, on the data they gave us. And so they were thrilled, uh, and, and we were thrilled, and um, you know, we really showed kind of the benefits of a hybrid model where we're doing both model-based and, and data-driven uh, approaches. And then the third one, this is a really interesting case. Um, this was purely data-driven as well, but a... Uh, but we'll use a, 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 new, a different technique. Um, this is for the rail itself, right? The rail surface itself. So the rail gets, you know, it's like the street, right? As you, as you drive the train over it, it starts wearing. And sometimes they crack, sometimes they wear down, sometimes they, uh, they uh, end up with these kind of wavy kind of de deformations on the surface. Um, you know, there's a variety of different things that can happen. And so they, they always need to, to, uh, to monitor them and, and make sure that it doesn't develop into something serious. So in the past, well, it, presently what they do is they inspect them visually, right? You have to go and look at the rails or you take pictures and you look at the pictures, but in either case, somebody has to do something. And so they say, well, hey, let's, let's put some cameras on, on the bottom of, of our cars and take lots of pictures and that'll make things easier which is what they did, but then they had tens of, not thou hundreds of thousands of pictures that somebody had to sit and stare at every day. And I don't know about you, but that's not the most exciting thing, uh, looking at rails all day um, to, that, that you can think about doing. So they said, well, let's, you know, we want to develop a system that does the image recognition and then the analytics on that recognized image. And, you know, this was, um, you know, not something that we had developed just for this project, coincidentally or, or fortunately for us, we have a big uh, research area in image processing, not surprisingly, due to copiers and printers. Um, and so we were able to bring that group into the project. And we had, they gave us a lot of pictures, thousands of pictures. Um, There's two main steps. The first step is do the image processing, right? So we went in, we processed the images, and then we turned that digital uh, into the data into digital data, and we basically were able to kind of classify things, look at things based on the pixels on, on each of these images, and then build a data-driven model that could classify, again, based on the pictures, uh, what's going on with the rail. Is the rail, so this is an interface, a, a screenshot of the interface, but you see the rail here, and then over here, um, it will tell you is the rail in a normal situation, or is it uh, is something wrong with it? Something weird going on with it? And it's all done based on uh, the machine. The, the computer does all that. And here we were able to get um, over 90% uh, accuracy on the true positives and less than 5% on the false positives. Um, and this is, uh, you know, it's a huge help to them because now 
if, if somebody looks at the rail, it's, uh, the picture of the rail itself, uh, an expert, they can figure out instantly if something's wrong with it. They just can't sit there and do that all day for all their pictures. So now what this does is you can pull out the ones that seem a little bit odd and then present only those to the expert and saves massive amounts of time and money. Um, and so they were, they were um, very thrilled with, with that research as well. Any questions and uh, comments? Yes. Uh, this shows a uh, five percent false positive. Yes. Uh, it, it, this number is small. Or? This is this is good. This is good. You don't want false positives, right? False positives means that uh, you know it flagged something, but it wasn't actually something wrong with it, right? But this uh, rare, rare surface detected very sick. Severe, I see. So, so the, the, the trick, if it's severe, um, then it's pretty obvious, right? If you have a big crack running down the middle of your, your rail, it's pretty obvious and you don't need anything sophisticated to tell you there's something wrong with it, right? What we wanted to do here is detect things that were very, very subtle, right? So the, if you think about it, the rail has a train, it's outside, right? There's Debris, so you know, so it's, it's not just a very clean uh, picture. You've got a lot of stuff on the rail, little, little. It's albeit small, but you've got you know little dots here, and there's rust and a variety of different things. And you have to ignore all those, right? If it's a little bit of rust and the rust isn't an issue for the rail, then you can't say that rust is a crack, right? Or the rust is a divot, right? So you have to teach your system to really look for the specific patterns that match a an issue, right? So if you have a small crack in the rail, that's a big issue. That can be a big issue because a crack will get bigger and bigger over time. Uh, if you have a little bit of dirt on the rail, that's not an issue, right? So you have to be able to figure out what looks like a crack and what looks like a little bit of dust. And that's where you know, the po false positives and, and true positives come in, is that sometimes you will classify a little bit of dirt as a small crack, even though it's not, right? And, and, um, at the stage that we're detecting it, it doesn't matter, right? In that case, the, the rails can be still used for probably many months, if not years, but we want to detect these things early so that we can then start figuring out, well, when do we want to do maintenance? And um, how do we, maybe we want to change design of the, the, the train or the track, or, you know, there's a variety of different things you can do if you know this, these things in advance. In any of these, uh, you know, modeling exercises, did you apply any kind of valuation or payoff type of scenarios? Yeah. yeah. That's what kind of building what this gentleman was asking. Yes, about. yes. No, that's a good question. In, in this case, no. In this case, we were working with a technical team uh, for this company, and they were really just looking at you know, the, tech, the, the, the technical issues. But we, we definitely do that um, because the next step in something like this would then be building a maintenance practice around that, right? And, and to do that, then you have to optimize for the time of the technician, where they're located, how long it'll take to get there, how much that costs, and things like that. Um, and then so then you have to, you know, you've got a whole other um, set of variables that you have to optimize for. And we, um, and then the other thing is prognostics, right? So not only is the situation the way it is now, but you want to know when it's going to get to the point where you have to actually do something, right? And so we would then build in algorithms for prognostics to figure out well, what's the future look like and then build those into the model to figure out then what your optimal maintenance schedule would be, for example. And that would then have a lot of the economics built into it as well. And then, you know, we do that for printers and copiers, right, all the time is the repair person, the service technician, the cost of sending them out, you know, what, do, what should they be repairing and looking at on that same visit. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? Because, I, it, it, I mean, it, it goes into this, this whole business model of, of what's going on with printing and copying nowadays, but really companies like Xerox are now kind of taking, uh, taking over the repair portion of it and just providing everything as a service. And so it's, it's, they're incentivized to make these things as cheap as, and uh, efficient as possible, right? So when your repair person goes out, maybe you went out to go fix some, um, you know, a roller that had been worn down, but you know, maybe on that visit you want to fix and re replace a few other things that may, that may not be broken at that time, but may break within the next six to 12 months, and then you save the visit, uh, which you know, will come, you know, will come at, 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 uh, off, your, off your bottom line, basically, or, or add to your bottom line. 
Hi, yes. Capital investment did the company have to make in this system for new sensors out on the out on the tracks and so forth? Was that what they all did they already have most of those or was it really um, that was new? That uh, it was uh, so it's, it's actually a yes and no. It, it wasn't, they had to put it in, it's new, but it was already in when, when they approached us. Right? So they put it in first, because they're all excited about big data, uh, and then they saw, cl started collecting all this data, uh, and then didn't know what to do with it, so then they came to us, and, and a variety of other people as well, um, to help them look at the data. So um, that's happened. But, you know, it, it's, it's really just starting, right? So they've outfitted these things, but, you know, they're not really integrated. They're, they're in, the, in the labs. They're not on operational trains for the most part. Uh, so there's a, um, some more to come, definitely. But that's a, actually a very interesting point because a lot of the roads in Japan also have a great deal of sensors embedded in the roadway. And my sense is they're collecting a lot of information and not really doing much with it. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. Have a question in the back? Is that a prerequisite of the project to rely basically on pre existing data? So were you limited in your research? To yeah, absolutely. Because it's, um, you know, for things like this, it's a pretty big investment just to put in the sensors. And so uh, starting to work with a company that's just putting in the sensors, you're probably two or three years away from actually collecting data. So it definitely is a prerequisite for when we're doing these types of analysis is that you, know, you already have the sensors in, in, in place. And maybe they're not the exact right ones necessarily, but at least you have data that we can start looking at. And, and then the next generation, we can say, oh, maybe if you put this type of sensor, you'll get better data. But even with your current data, we can tell x and y. Yes? What was the data set that you have to actually evaluate the whole thing? And in what way? Because in order to come up with a numerical result, I'm guessing you'll have to manually label the data. Yes, yes, yes. So what was the training set for the data? So with all the data, with the data-driven um, models, you're absolutely right. The, the data needs to be labeled, meaning if the data is uh, from a, um, we need to know if the data is coming from a piece of equipment that is acting uh, normally or if it's in, a, in, a, in one of the various faults that they're trying to di um, classify. Um, and then what we do is we build the models and we train the models and then we test the models on a, on a different set to see if they're right, you know, they work or not. Um, but yeah, absolutely, all the data needs to be labeled. Um, and you know, for, for things like this, when we, we train using the um, the, the ground truth or labeled data, but then when we, the outputs, you can actually just look and see, you know, at the, at the picture whether uh, we've classified them correctly or not. So I'm pretty much at the end. I mean, this is, uh, you know, um, the, the, this is the back of park. Um, we, we do things in, um, Big data for industrial equipment. Um, for the rail is just one example. You know, printers and copiers, of course. Uh, but we've got a project now working with an elevator manufacturer to model elevators. Um, you know, we have a lot of uh, image analytics types of big data projects, um, and then a whole bunch of other projects that we didn't even touch on today. Um, and so, um, you know, my job is to find partners for us to, to, to kind of take these to the next level. If you're interested in any of these, um, feel free to, to reach out to me. Um, I, uh, yeah. Well, Aki, that's kind of my next question. Okay. What's the future for uh, this uh, system? So this is the, when was it implemented uh, fully by the Japanese partner? So the system is still in it's in a um, a demo phase right now, a pilot phase, I guess is the right uh, is a better terminology. So they're testing it internally um, with their researchers and and some of the maintenance people, but it's not implemented yet. So the next step would be once you get feedback from the tests, then to um, find a, a, a somebody else that does uh, system development because Park doesn't do system development and the research team at the client doesn't do system development either. So it's do the system development and the integration would be the next step which um, you know, optimistically would probably happen within the next 
year or two. Does that mean you have the whole train? Everything? This? Everything? Uh, no, it just means we have the door. You have the door. The door, yeah. Well, the door, I mean, these three things we've got, and then, you know, we work on some of the, we're talking about some of the other things, but no, not, no, I mean, there's so many things, and, and there's a lot of things that they haven't even started looking at, right? Like the, the HVAC system, the, the overhead wires, I mean, there's so many things um, still that could be outfitted. Yes? So while you're speaking to things, can you tie all that back to your perception or definition of the Internet of Things? Um, so, I, you know, I think... IoT is a, is a big buzzword right now, and I think a lot of it will is, is still just buzz. Um, but I think, you know, what's what's exciting to me about a project like this is that we're actually using IoT, and in this case, uh, I think it comes in as the IIoT, the Industrial Internet of Things. But, you know, we're showing that you can actually get real value from you know, all this data that's coming in. Uh, and it's not just about sending you better ads or coupons uh, to your smartphone, right? Um, so that's, that's what I think is, is pretty interesting and exciting about these types of things is that, you know, now we're finally getting to the, to the point where, yeah, we are, we can see real value because this, you know, this will save a lot of money in maintenance, of course, but also it will improve service and safety uh, for, for the passengers, right? And, and as this con con continues to, um, to develop, you know, at, at the end of the day, also costs as well for, for both the companies, but also the, the passengers, right? So I think, um, I don't know if that answered your question exactly, but I think it's, a, it's a, one of the, for us, it's a really exciting area. And it's not just research, it's actually application, and it's providing some, some real value out there that, you know, we're trying to make the world a little bit, little bit of a better place. So, Aki, um Park is involved in a number of different technology areas. I know that you've done a lot of work on ethnographic research, and I know that Park had things like a uh, new kind of water filtration system for water purification that was really exciting. How is it that Park got this job? Was it the uh, kind of did um, the actual awarding of the job? Was it because of, um, you know, something else the, the center had done, or did you are you are, are, are you asking Are you asking how, how did Park get this specific job with the rail company, or how did we get the job? Right, of, with the rail company. Yeah, so the, with the rail company, I mean, you know, they had a big need. You know, they invested millions of dollars uh, into equipment to, to gather uh, information and, and they had a um, they, they had a well they have a pretty visionary uh, leader of, of that group that you know he, he kind of is is on the leading edge of thinking about CBM condition based maintenance and so you, you actually will see a lot of publications written by him or co-authored co by him about CBM in rail um, and so he wanted to make this vision a reality within his company and uh, so they made the investment into outfitting a lot of their equipment with sensors, uh, and then they realize, you know, they need to actually make investments into people analyzing the data uh, from, coming from this equipment. So they were looking for partners, and, um, you know, we happen to have a, a, a pretty big effort into analytics, uh, both here and in Asia, and so we uh, happened to cross, cross paths at one point, and we sat down, and, and they said, hey, this, this looks interesting. And, you know, it started out small. Um, and we, we had a, a small feasibility where they gave us a little bit of data. You know, we signed a CDA, and they gave us a little bit of data. And, um, you know, we came back to them and said, hey, look, you know, we can do something with this. And so then it kind of scaled up, and then we were able to do multiple different projects and kind of, you know, went, went from there. Yes? Two, connect, connect, two questions. Sure. One is who owns the patents and the IP on this? And what's your future plan using same technology to expand to other industries? Yeah, so those are related questions, definitely. Um, uh, so there's there's multiple ways to cut this up, but essentially uh, there's two types of there's two types of patents, right? There's the the background information, the background patents, the things that we've developed kind of prior to going into the partnership with this company, and then there's the project IP. Uh, the IP that's generated in the project. And the way our model works is that when we do these types of collaborate, we call them collaborations just because it sounds cool, but basically they pay us. Um, it's, no, it's, not, it's not like a 50-50 uh, thing. They're paying us. 
Uh, and that's just how our model has to work based on the way we're structured. But um, so they're paying us, right? And we're developing things on their behalf. So uh, and 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 this is a case by case thing. But typically, and and this project is very similar. What happens is that Park still maintains ownership of the patents that are developed in the project. But then for the client, we give them uh, typically exclusive rights to use that. Um, patent within their field of use, right? Within their application. So for rail, for these patents, they can use exclusively. Um, but maybe these algorithms work on on elevator doors, for example. Or I don't know. We haven't tried it, but other types of doors, not in rail. And this company doesn't happen to make elevators, right? So we have then the right to continue to use these uh, patents within other fields of use. Which then, you know, you can see we continue to build on our asset of IP while providing the value to the customer that they're looking for, right? Without conflicting with each other. So that's typically the way we like to structure these things. Obviously, you know, sometimes the client just wants to own everything, right? And then there's a there's a cost to that, right? So there's a negotiation, and um, depending on how much you pay, then you get more access, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Sorry to say who the client customer is. I did not. <laughs> it's a big secret. Um, so yeah, they uh, they in this case they preferred to not be public yet. Um, you know, it's not it's not they're not obviously ashamed of doing this, but I think they um, you know they have got some business reasons why they want to keep it confidential. Yeah, it's a, it's a railway operator in, in Asia. So. Actually, there are a lot more possibilities for that than there used to be. Yeah, that's true. That's uh, true. Because of the regional dividing up, and, and also there's a number of private railways in Japan as well. Yeah. Um, Aki, was it your sense that the uh, other side, the the receiving side for this, uh, did they have qualified people who could who can run the software system and so forth, or was a lot of training involved for them? No, I, I think by and large they were qualified. I mean, they're you know they know a heck of a lot more about trains than we do. Uh, all we know are, uh, is how to, to mess with data. Um, and so there's, there was an extensive training, and in fact, you know, they were the ones really giving us the requirements for what this thing would look like and how it would be used. Um, and so, in some ways, they were kind of training us to to build uh, the um, the pilot version that um, that would be um, most useful to them. So they're very qualified. That you know, the thing that they were missing the most is the the actual data scientists, right? They didn't. We have you know, depending on how you count it, we have about 150 data scientists at Park, uh, mostly with PhDs. So a lot of people looking at data. Whereas within this company, I think you know, they have tens of thousands of employees and probably just a handful of people that you could call data scientists, right? So there was a pretty good match in that, you know, obviously they know a lot about rail, but a little bit less about data, and we know almost nothing about rail, but a heck of a lot about data. So we were able to uh, marry those two things together and have a, a really good partnership. And of course, that's one of the keys for this uh, seminar series is the point that uh, I think the analysis here, uh, big data analysis, is um, probably still further advanced than just about uh, anywhere else. Yeah, I think so. And I, I mean, you know, in Asia particularly, there's a lot of really good technologies in Asia. But I think the type of uh, you know d analytics that were not, it's not just Park either. The types of analytics that happen quite often here in Silicon Valley in the U.S. Uh, it seems just from anecdotal um, experience that. It's it's not quite what's available in, in in Asia, right? And that's why this company came all the way across the Pacific to have a project with a company in Silicon Valley, as opposed to sourcing it domestically, which you know would have been a lot easier and cheaper probably if it had existed. How do you overcome the language barrier when you? I mean, the specific terms are all different. Yeah. Right. We have, uh, I mean, it, you know, we've worked with, with Asian companies and in particular Japanese companies for a long time. So at the very least, we kind of know how 
communication and the culture works. And then the other piece is, you know, when we need to, we, hire, we have interpreters and, you know, all the documents are translated. Um, and so there's, you know, so there's that overhead as well and it still makes it worth doing, right? So there's certainly, um, yeah, there's certainly some barriers and particularly you can imagine Asian railway companies don't have people that are, um, you know, really kind of, not many people that are internationally focused, right? There's a lot of domestic uh, folks that, that, that kind of are, um, you know, haven't spent time abroad. Um, and so there's definitely that challenge. But they were all, I mean, they're great. They are great, and we're still working with them. Um, they're very excited about the technology and what's going on. And, and for an infrastructure company, I would say they're one of the more progressive, forward-looking companies. Because, you know, infrastructure, you, you typically are conservative, and they don't want to incorporate too many new things, right, for a lot of obvious uh, reasons. Uh, but these guys are pretty um, forward-looking, so it's been, it's been a really great uh, experience working with them. Yes? Question. How many great ideas did you have on the flight at the park? And how many of them are for all of them? Um, so how many great ideas do we have? Uh, I think we have, um, it, you know, it's hard to count. It, I, there's new ideas every day, right? It's, and it's, it depends on how you define ideas. And, and we're now I'm talking more broadly uh, than analytics, and it's just Parker in general. But, you know, the, the scientists are there because they have great ideas, and they're, they're thinking of new things all the time. And, you know, I'm in meetings where they're just kind of inventing as we're, we're talking through these things. And they're like, stop inventing. We're trying to get something done here. Um, so they come up with new ideas all the time, and um, you know, but a lot of them never come to fruition, right? I mean, that's the whole thing of innovation is you try a hundred things, and maybe you know, if you're lucky, ten of them work, um, and that's you know, that's kind of the hit rate that we go for. So you have to, I think, the thing that one of the things that makes Park, but also Silicon Valley, and and kind of the mindset here different than what I uh, find in Asia quite often is that. There's a, um, there's a tolerance for failure, right? And a tolerance for things not going right because you know you have to try nine things before you get that one thing correctly. Whereas in a lot of Asian cultures, and I'm not just talking about Japan, um, but this is also prevalent in Japan, is that if you fail at something even once, then you've got this mark, right? And you've got this, you know, whether it's a project that you tried or, you know, for example, if you're in Japan and you leave a major corporation, you're never going back to that company, at least in that same position along that same track, right? You, you, you've kind of tried something different and now you're in a different track. Whereas in the US, you can try something different. You can go fail at a, a startup, but you take a lot of the lessons learned and come back and you're in a higher position with better, better um, salary, right? So the, there's a different, definitely a different culture towards uh, um, coming up with new ideas and, and uh, failing at them. Or, Aki, do you think that their main motivation for this system was cost savings, or um, was it um, a lot of safety issues that they were concerned about? Yeah, I think I think it's it's more about safety and service to the customer. Um, you know, obviously they want to to lower cost, um, but I don't think that was the main motivation. Um, you know, they're they're looking at improving service to the customer and maintaining, or if not improving, the safety of, of uh, what they provide. So I think those two things were first, and then the cost, you know, definitely it shouldn't cost a lot more, um, and, and ideally it would cost less, but it wasn't the main driver for this, this uh, initiative. That's interesting because one of the uh, points about Smart Grid right now is that it seems that for the power companies, uh, cost savings is a much bigger motivator than just about anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and it's the same kind of thing: maintenance to know when something is going going down, or even to predict when it would go down. Uh, and you know that's uh, so. This is very much an improvement in safety and service. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Aki, thanks very much for a really interesting story of successful international business. This is great. It's really great to see uh, this kind of new uh, system going in place. We look forward to hearing, um, you know, after they have really moved it to commercial, out of the development phase, it'll be great to hear back of, of what kind of results they've had on it. So everybody, if you would join me, uh, please join me in giving a round of applause to Aki for a great... <laughs>